Welcome, Professor Deepesh Chakrabarty at Warsaw University. And uh, uh, just to let you know before, um, yes, the streaming is starting, so I hope we will be able to, uh, to take uh, uh, your questions from the room, of course, but also the participants online, uh, because this lecture was uh, advertised also by me. <laughs> And I could see on Twitter that it's uh, that it's very um, it's a very popular tweet. So, so I hope some scholars, some colleagues, will join us from abroad. And um, yes, so uh, I am uh, once again I am uh, absolutely honoured that uh, that I can introduce Professor Deepesh Chakrabarty, who is very well known to Polish audience. Some of his works were, of course, translated into Polish. Um, um, for me, uh, personally, and I think for other uh, environmental humanities scholars, the text uh, Climate History for Thesis that appeared in the journal Text the Drugie was very important uh, for us, for our um, historiographical methodologies, but we are not only historians here, so. So undoubtedly, Professor is also recognized uh, globally, and uh, I would coin myself uh, a short, let's say, group, what is uh, the most um, important for uh, frameworking, maybe also this conference discussion. I would say that Professor um, is um, important because of raising the question of non-human histories along with the natural status of humans at the same planetary course of history. So, to put it in other words, joining human history or what we call also natural history is one of the, the most crucial issues for us. And uh, formally, I have to add that Professor is the Lawrence A. Kimpton Distinguished Service Professor of History, affiliated with South Asian Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago. He is the author of, this is the recent publication from 2021, The Climate of History in a, uh, in a Planetary Age, and among others, and of course I chose only some um, important publications, is The Crisis of Civilization, Exploring Global and Planetary Histories. So the word planetary repeats quite often. And today, in this rainy Warsaw morning, but also streamed worldwide, we are going to hear a, le a lecture titled, If Trees and Rivers Have Standing, What Do We Do With Microbes? Once again, my name is Anna Bach, and I will moderate the discussion afterwards. The floor is yours. Thank you for that introduction, and I'm very honored to be here, and very grateful to the organizing committee, especially Gabriela, where is she? She's somewhere here, uh, for the invitation to join you. And uh, since I'm starting off the conference, uh, I hope what I have to say connects with what comes after uh, me. Um, I, I wish to speak for no more than 50 minutes so what I will do is put my timer on and it will beep at 50 minutes and I'll stop mid-sentence if I have to and uh, and take questions and, and hopefully be able to um, uh, okay here goes the timer uh, be able to um, explain myself during the Q&A um, so m the title of my talk, uh, 
always happens with conferences they ask you for a title you give a title and then you talk about something else but uh, but here it's it's not completely something else but the title of the talk was inspired by Christopher Stone's book uh, should trees have standing and of course he by standing he means legal standing he means a situation where somebody can advocate for you uh, that somebody can uh, produce an argument that a tree's interest or a river's interest are being harmed and therefore legal action could be taken. Um, the reason why, um, well I've been thinking about viruses and bacteria since the pandemic more seriously and, um, and if, you, if you think about it you will find that uh, whether you think about um, peasant cultures, even per peasant cultures in Europe uh, before modern technology or you think of peasant culture somewhere else and indigenous cultures, um, you will find that human beings have always been able to imaginatively extend their understanding, sometimes through anthropomorphizing the non-human. Um, uh, I mean we even talk about old mountains, young mountains, a life cycle of a mountain. Uh, so it is, it is possible to extend our, um, our understanding at least to some degree to birds as Vinci and Despre's work shows to uh, animal studies. And of course if I think of Indian culture it's full of stories where animals are part of human world uh, including modern li literature. So but uh, the reason why I thought of viruses and, uh, and bacteria is of course that that viruses, viruses and bacteria are something we know about through modern science. So without the invention of the microscope you wouldn't have known about vi bacteria and viruses. And um, even microbiology was a subject that was created at the end of the 19th century uh, between 1850s and 1880s. And, um, and it's very hard to actually extend our imagination in the same way to bacteria and viruses as we can with animals and trees and, and plants. And, uh, and the other interesting thing is that bacteria and viruses are the majority forms of life. In numerically and by weight, there are more of them than animals and plants. Uh, and the pandemic only underlines the emphasis. So what I want to do is in the two sections of my talk, I want to first of all talk about the emphasis that is now being given to indigenous knowledges uh, as uh, something very different from modern Western knowledges. But I want to go to a moment um, when this question became important in the West. In other words, when did looking at uh, indigenous peoples become a political question for European theorists? And, and and I will argue that a lot of it had to do with May 68 in Paris. Uh, so in that part of the talk, I will basically discuss the work of the Brazilian anthropologist, Eduardo Viveiros de Castro, who is very well known in the, in the world of decolonizing thought, in the efforts of decolonizing thought, because he is the person who first formulated about what he called perspective, multi-perspective views of Amerindians and the, and the very idea that, that if the West has uh, one nature and many cultures, the Amerindians actually have many natures. You know, they actually have something that he describes as multi, multinaturalism. So he's been very important in um, radically kind of rethinking modernity and, and, and Western culture. I will, be, uh, I will begin with him and then go on to the question of viruses and and end with the argument if i have if my 50 minutes would let me do it as to why we really need to look at look at indigenous knowledges and peasant knowledges again uh, at this moment but how this moment is different from the 68 moment uh, so um, so Deborah Danowski, the philosopher, and Eduardo uh, Vieros de Castro's, Vieros de Castro's compelling and thoughtful book, The Ends of the World, which was published in Portuguese in 2014 and came out in English in 2017, 
uh, that book gives me a point of entry into this question. So I appear in the section of the book where they discuss Edward Wilson's, uh, E.O. Wilson's use of the word species. And my use of Wilson's use of the word species in that four thesis uh, article that you were talking about. And um, I mean, it's not important how, why they're criticizing me, but it's clearly they, they say that the properly um, ethnopolitical situation of humans, of the human as intensive and extensive multiplicity of peoples must be acknowledged. So, one of the, so their objection is that the Wilsonian notion of species is a tributary of modernity's apolitical, ahistorical conception of nature, as well as science's absolute power of arbitrage. So those are the two objections they have. In other words, species makes humanity into one, one thing, and this is done through the power of science for arbitration. And, it, and instead they argue that the properly ethnopolitical situation of the human as intensive and extensive multiplicity of peoples must be acknowledged as being directly implicated in the Anthropocene crisis. The most important word here is multiplicity. Uh, so even if you go back to uh, uh, De Castro's own book, uh, cannibal metaphysics, you will actually find that the word multiplicity is what connects their work to what Deleuze and Guattari were writing about in their two books, Anti Oedipus and The Thousand Plateaus, which were published in, uh, I think, Anti Oedipus in the 1970s, and, and uh, The Thousand Plateaus comes a few years later as the second volume. And so the word multiplicity um, is connected in the French discussion. So it sort of goes back to May 68 and basically the rebellion on the streets of Paris against the absolutism of the Communist Party, the Communist Party's own conception of uh, oneness, either of the proletariat or of the revolution or the political subject. And and this is part of the French anarchical tradition of thinking against the state. So there's a very interesting circular movement. So if you read Deleuze and Guattari, they are themselves reading Western anthropologists' account of both Native American tribes and African segmentary societies, acephalic societies, to find empirical evidence of people who have lived without the state. And therefore, it comes out of an argument against the state. So, and they are themselves inspired by Pierre Clastres' classic book called Society Against the State, which is itself an anarchist uh, um, text. So, so, French anarchism has a lot to do with this moment. And the French anarch, for them, the ethnography of Native American uh, tribal groups or African societies, that ethnography furnishes them with empirical evidence that there are human societies, there are human groups who have lived without necessarily organizing themselves around a state. And the name they give to that uh, in Antidipus, the name they give to that principle is multiplicity. So if you remember Foucault Michel Foucault wrote the introduction to anti -Oedipus. And Foucault described anti -Oedipus as a text for anti-fascist form of life. And he actually said, always prefer multiplicity to uniformity. And this distinction between multiplicity and the one, that is the oneness of the state, so it's kind of a one and the many problem, this distinction becomes in the second book, uh, a Thousand Plateaus, <coughs> the distinction between state and nomadology. Right? So the idea that the, the distinction between being sedentary and being nomadic. And the, and the idea was that being nomadic and being sedentary, being, multi being on the side of multiplicity, 
is to be able to resist the uniformity of the state. Why? Because see, all these people were opposed to the legacy of the Hegelian idea that the state represents something universal, that the state can speak for everybody. So their idea was that the, I, that the universal is a ruse of power, something that claims to speak universally for somebody is actually speaking for power. And the way to resist that is not to speak for one, is to speak for multiplicity and therefore connected to multiplicity was the idea of being minor. So Deleuze famously wrote about Kafka as an example of minor literature. That is literature that does not even aspire to be major. And this has to do with the resistance to what you might call majoritarianism, wanting to be part of majority. And again, it, this thought itself has uh, a genealogy. So if you go back and read Hannah Arendt's uh, collection of essays on the Jewish question, you'll find that Har Arendt, this is before the Holocaust, she's writing about, we're debating whether or not there should be a Jewish majority state in Israel. And she's in favor of Jewish settlement in Israel, but not in favor of a Jewish majority state. I mean, this question is eventually undercut. The Holocaust happens, and the question can't be discussed anymore. But she makes a very interesting dis uh, distinction between what she calls the assimilated parvenu Jew and the pariah Jew. Now, Hannah Arendt today would not have used the word pariah because pariah is a Tamil Indian word, and it refers to somebody who is outcast, made an outcast, thrown out of society. And this typically referred, typically the name for the use for low caste people, people outside of society. So today it would be a politically bad word to use. But she was writing in the 30s, and, her, and therefore her heroes were people she thought of as unassimilated pariah Jews. And her example was Kafka, among other people. And Kafka is Deleuze's example of a minor voice. That is a voice that does not want to be the voice of majority. And therefore the idea of um, multiplicity was connect to the, I connected to the idea of being minor. And, and, uh, and then the idea of being minor gets connected to the idea of nomadology, being nomadic. So if the state stood for one, then the the nomadic, the multiple, uh, the minor were figures of that which re not only resisted the state, but did not want to create another state. And therefore this very fundamental principle of an anarchist principle was part of May 68, was part of what inspires Eduardo Viveros de Castro to go back and study American Indians more intensively. And this is what also influences Bruno Latour's uh, text, We've Never Been Modern. So what you have actually by the time Latour writes, We've Never Been Modern, you have a European position that theoretically opposes the European modern to the indigenous non-modern. And in that position, I mean, we don't have to go into this unless this is uh, in the Q&A, unless somebody is interested. What is forgotten in that opposition is people I called the later moderns, people from China, India, Africa, Brazil, who actually want to be modern, who pursue modernization. Uh, or even people like Franz Fanon, who want to, to be modern. But going back to the idea of being minor, in fact, one person who is now being upheld as an example of um, speaking with the voice of minority is Gandhi, himself in his South African days. So you know, Gandhi comes to India late in his career. He's 50. I mean, when I, when I speak, when I was under 50, I'm not you know, far away from 50 now, but when I was under 50, I always took heart from the fact that two people made their careers, global careers, after they were 50. One was Gandhi and the other one was Freud. And uh, so Gandhi comes back to India after he's 50. And India, of course, amplifies him. He becomes audible globally. But if you look at Gandhi before he comes to India, Gandhi is always 
making friends with people who are in a minority. So gay people, vegetarians, European missionaries who are opposed to empires. His ashram is full of these kind of people who are not, who don't stand for the majority, who don't even want to belong to a majority. And in South Africa, people he's working with, everybody belongs to a minority group. So this part of Gandhi's life is sometimes actually analyzed, uh, particularly by my friend Faisal Devji, who teaches in Oxford, as this example of becoming minor. So if you think of six, the 68 as a moment then, what Deleuze and Guattari find in the empirical evidence of indigenous societies are actual instances that can support the political principle and the possibility of a society that resists the state where everybody wants to live in a state of minority. Right? It is, it's, so it's kind of completely opposed to the nation state principle. Most nation states are actually built on the basis of some kind of everyday majoritarianism. I mean, the comfort of most nation states is that we, we, we are implicitly major majority. So if I go to India, the Hindus are in an implicit majority. And it's that comfort of familiarity. Uh, if I go to my neighboring Bangladesh, most people are, they speak my language, but they are implicitly Muslim majority. And that kind of everyday f majoritarianism that speaks to the state was something that these people were trying to fight, oppose. And therefore they thought that the most fundamental principle of an anti-fascist politics would be to embrace multiplicity. And they thought that in the study of the indigenous societies, they are finding a principle of that. The Deleuze has a very interesting sentence where he says that when the state, I mean, this you will find illustrated in Polish history many times over, when the state thinks of a state, when the state thinks of territory, it divides the earth. So it draws lines on the earth saying this is the national boundary. In indigenous society, they were saying they only divide up human beings into moieties and clans. They don't divide the earth. So there are no boundaries like this that you can't cross. The boundaries are porous, but the divisions are of kinship. So you divide humans, but you don't divide the earth. That actually is a line of thought we, I won't pursue here, but that links up directly what Carl Schmitt was saying in the Nomos of the Earth about modernity not only dividing up land, but eventually dividing up the seas, dividing up the skies. And this also links up with Karl Polanyi's thesis of uh, disembedding of the economy, disembedding of territory, uh, what Deleuze would call deterritorialization of the human imagination, uh, eventually. But we don't need to go there. The reason why I'm saying this is to draw a contrast. So fundamentally then, um, this is a political moment. That's why Viveros de Castro uses the word ethnopolitics of humanity. This is a very anthropocentric moment. In the Deleuze and Guattari discussion, um, um, it's really talking about the state as a human formation and how do you fight it. And the opening to the indigenous, to the tribal, is an opening that is looking for empirical instances of people who have actually lived without the state. And therefore finding in them an inspiration for a political possibility of anti-fascist living. So from there, let me take you to uh, the second part of my presentation, which is really about what, what is not discussed on, on those texts in 68, viruses and bacteria, right? which is what we are living with at the moment in, in, the, in, in the pandemic. Uh, we've become much more aware of the fact of actually, let me, mm, let me just quickly see, we've got half, got half an hour left, so which is not bad. Um, the pandemic has registered a profound shift in the constitution of the everyday normal for the late modern urban humans of the post-antibiotic period in medicine. So I'm really saying the major 
thing that de that defines our moment is the discovery of the antibiotics in the 1930s and as you know in the second world war antibiotics actually saved a lot of life and we are defined by Pierre Charbonnier uh, in his book on affluence and liberty defines us as the heirs of the industrial and imperial impetus the simultaneous acknowledgement and forgetting of deep geobiological histories of life and of the planet, of the ocean of microbes that is both inside and outside our bodies, were often contained in the fatic aspect of our everyday exchanges. So once you are cut off the land, once you are cut off your peasant background, once you come to think today, for instance, that you can eat mangoes right throughout the year, uh, I grew up in India sort of knowing that mangoes were a summer fruit. Now I eat mangoes all through the year, thanks to cold storage, refrigerated trucks, refrigerated containers, mangoes. I've, forgo I've forgotten the connection between mangoes and seasons. So once you're in that moment of industrial civilization, where you, where you can forget the seasons, uh, then what happens is that th this deep historical work that the planet does gets contained in the fatigue aspect of our everyday exchanges. When we greet each other with a remark on the weather, or we, we, acknowledged, we acknowledge, as it were, the work of the sun, the clouds, wind, trees, plants, light, and shade, the planetary in short, but only for a brief moment before transitioning on to what Roman Jacobson called informative communication that was much more closely tied in our practices to the more important business of advancing our individual and collective human ends. Considered in separation from what we usually seek to contain in the fatigue. So I say the late modern and urban human for clearly, for someone in a rural or indigenous context, a deficit of sun sunshine or rain would have more immediate and palpable consequences. The fatigue utterance in the case of the late modern urban post-antibiotic person was a measure of the cultural distance or indifference they normally experienced with regard to the deep historical work of all that sustains life on the planet. So the more industrial you become, you kind of become forgetful of actually what sustains life. Because if you remember what sustains life, you'd actually have to remember bacteria all the time, the role that they play in even producing the oxygen that we breathe. But we forget that the more we industrial and technological our society becomes. So our normal moment for us is one that allows us to forget or ignore the life-supporting work that microbes do even when we are not in a position intellectually to deny their presence. <coughs> the fact that the offending virus today cannot be contained in the structure of the fatigue. So today, it's very hard to ask somebody, how are you, without that question becoming serious because particularly in places like India or other where they may have lost somebody to the pandemic. And I have lost people, uh, relatives and friends, to the pandemic. So this qu question, which used to be a way of forgetting, kind of remembering and forgetting the, the work of my microbes, planet, etc., suddenly became an important question. And you, and you couldn't, it was not a container. So that fact that the offending virus today cannot any longer be contained in the fatigue has some ironical implications, both for the history and theory of uh, biopolitics, as is what enunciated by Michel Foucault in the 1970s. So let me remind you of a particular day in 1978, 8th of February. Foucault was already engaged in giving a series of public lectures at the Collège de France, elaborating on his idea of biopower and the governmentalization of the state. Everything was apparently going well until this day arrived when Foucault felt unwell as he stood at the pulpit to begin the fifth lecture on biopolitics. He had a touch of the flu, so there was a virus in his environment. He began with an apology. He said, I must apologize because I will be more muddled than usual today. I've got the flu and don't feel very well. And he had, Foucault wanted to proceed with the lecture as he had some misgivings about first let his, letting, letting his audience gather and then telling them to leave at the last minute. So he decided to talk for as long as he could and asked in advance for forgiveness for both the quality as well as the quantity of what he had to say. 
So think of what is happening to Foucault's category today, right? Foucault is lecturing on population. He saw population as the natural entering politics. And he used the word species in a slightly misleading way, I think. But, but he was beginning to say, look, from the 18th century on, population is something that human, that the state has to care about in the same way that the state had begun to care about forests, for instance. It should the forest grow too much? Should the forest be too, too reduced? Uh, do, you, do, you, do you actually, when do you cut trees and all of those things? So eventually he said that this is a natural, this is natural history coming into politics. A, 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 a product of nature having to be managed by government. Just as forests were managed by government and you know, German played a leading role in forest management, as you know. And out of that he, developed the idea of biopower, that biopower has to do with the fact of this, um, that, um, that um, with the fact that, uh, as he said, it goes without saying that not everything natural can be part of politics. So Foucault had this idea which doesn't apply today. He said, look, it goes without saying that the fact that since a certain point of time we have known that the Earth is a planet, has had no influence on the Earth's position in the cosmos. So his position was that human thinking does not affect the Earth. We, we know it's a planet, but the Earth doesn't care. Even if you didn't know the Earth was a planet, the Earth would remain a planet. But population is something different, where whether it grows, whether it, the cities become too crowded, has impact if crowded cities produce more diseases. Now, first of all, Foucault was wrong. I mean, how we think of the Earth affects the Earth. It's precisely because uh, now that we know that carbon dioxide has a certain role in the atmosphere, we try to behave different or we should be behaving differently uh, because our behavior affects the earth. But his point was that that population was, a, was really when uh, the nature, natural becomes part of global history, of, of, of the history of the state. The pandemic, interestingly, uh, is not just about global history. The pandemic reminds us of the story of viruses and um, Anthony Fauci, the man who was advising Trump, and is still the still advi main advisor in uh, America on the pandemic. Dr. Fauci, who is a specialist of infectious diseases, but who also writes as an academic, published an, an article in 2020, when the pandemic was on, in a biology journal called Cell, where he and his, uh, his uh, co-worker, David Morens, were not only arguing that we have entered an era of pandemics because of human expansion, the expansion of human civil cutting down of, main reason was cutting down of forests and the fragmentation of the habitats of wildlife and forcing wildlife to come close to us and therefore the viruses being able to switch host. But they were also actually in the process arguing that it is not at all clear that um, we can defeat viruses and bacteria in this ongoing sort of battle, what looks like a battle between human beings and, and this uh, vital world. Now, and they actually quote a uh, Nobel winning biologist who said that, that if you look at um, the story of humans become aware of viruses from the end of the 17th century and bacteria from the 19th century, the from the time that humans become aware of viruses and they're fighting them, whether in trees or plants, in tobacco leaves or in their own bodies. That story of the battle between humans and viruses can be written up as, as a thriller called Their Genomes Versus Our Wits. So their genomes versus our intelligence. And Fauci said, it is not at all clear who is in the evolutionary driver's seat. So if you think about the story of the virus, we now think about the Delta variant to the Omicron to B15, et cetera. The virus is evolving as all f forms of life do. And because it goes through several, evolution happens over generation. The virus goes through several generations in one human lifetime. So in a way, 
the pandemic is part of a Darwinian history. It's an episode in Darwinian history of, of evolution of life. The virus is actually enacting before us uh, a Darwinian piece of history. While we debate the virus in terms of global history. So we debate the virus in terms of how much power WHO should have. Should, was, was, was it right for China to hide information in the beginning? Should we give more power to WHO? There's a virologist called Nathan Wolf who actually argues that there should we should set up commando groups for detecting outbreaks of pandemics or potential pandemics because we're going to have more pandemics because we are cutting down forests. And the argument was that we should use satellite telephony because every time there's a pandemic, the satellite telephone chatter goes up. It increases. So the argument was that we should give everybody a, a cell phone. And there should be a centralization of the information so that WHO will be able to monitor where the chatter is going up to find where a potential pandemic could break out. And there will be a commando type force that will go into the nation and lock down those people to keep the virus from spreading. So, so this, see, this becomes a question about equal access to vaccination, funding for vaccination, about sovereignty, about power of the nation state, and whether we should have some kind of global governance when it comes to pandemic. So we discuss the pandemic in terms of human history and globalization and global history and sovereignty state theory. But one another part of the pandemic is about this Darwinian uh, history that is enacting itself, which is about evolution of life forms. So Lynn Margulis and Doria Sagan reminded their readers some times ago that our species are not lords, but partners. We are in mute, intercontrovertible partnership with, with photosynthetic organisms that feed us, the microbial gas producers that provide oxygen, and the heterotrophic bacteria and fungi that remove oxygen and convert our waste. No political or technological advance can dissolve that partnership. Researchers in infectious diseases have been for long aware of this aspect of the deep and always present history of humans, that is the deep history of humans. And um, <coughs> so interestingly, what you find is also that medical strategies for fighting microbes end up as stories of their evolution. So again, so you might think of it as, as history of technology and global history of technology, but it actually all becomes part of a Darwinian history. The emergence of novel pathogens, right, some virologist, is now being facilitated by modern developments exposing more potential human victims and or making transmission between humans more efficient than before. For example, new met methods of blood transfusion has act have acted as avenues for the spread of hepatitis C. The commercial Bushman trade leading to the circulation of retroviruses, industrial food production has led to, the, led to bovine spongiform encephalitis, BSC, International travel has spread cholera. Intravenous drugs have spread HIV. Vaccine production has have led to outbreaks of simian virus 40. All these and other developments are creating susceptible pools of elderly, antibiotic-treated, immunosuppressed patients. A particular evolutionary advantage that the coronavirus has over humans is the generic instability of microorganisms allowing rapid microbial evolution to adapt to ever-changing ecological niches. So to come back to my point is that if this is fundamentally an evolutionary struggle, this reminds us that humans, the species called Homo sapiens, for all their mastery of technology, are not outside of the Darwinian history of life and evolution that unfolds on the planet. Infectious diseases in humans are about microbial survival by their co-opting certain of our genetic cellular and immune mechanisms to ensure their continuing transmission. So infectious diseases are actually about the deep evolutionary connection that exist between our bodies and other bodily forms of life, which is one reason why we can develop vaccines by testing them on other animals. So um, let me come to the, to the last part of my talk then. So if microbes 
are, as Paul Falkowski in his book, Life is Life's Engine, How Microbes Made the Earth Inhabitable, he says there are in fact far more species of microbes than there are of plants and animals combined. In her introductory book on viruses, Dorothy Crawford writes, microbes are by far the most abundant form of life on Earth. Globally, there are about five times 10 to the power of 30 bacteria. And virus is at least 10 times more common, that number. Thus making viruses the most numerous microbes on Earth. The oceans cover 65% of the globe's surface. And there are up to 10 billion viruses per liter of seawater. So every liter contains 10 billion viruses. The whole ocean contains about 4 times 10 to the power 30, enough viruses when laid side to side to span 10 million light years. In addition, they play a very important role in maintaining life on Earth. The ocean's floating population of plankton is made up of viruses, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. One group of plankton, the phytoplankton, which are plants, consists of organisms that use solar energy and carbon dioxide to generate energy by photosynthesis. They produce half of the world's oxygen. So if you killed off the viruses and the phytoplankton, half of the oxygen would not be available. And you have to remember that we can breathe because oxygen is constantly refreshed in the atmosphere. Oxygen is a reactive gas. It mixes up with other gases. So you have to constantly supply the oxygen with fresh oxygen for creatures like us to live. And that job of supplying the air with fresh oxygen is done by these so-called inferior forms of life. So if they go, we go even though we are fighting one variety of virus at, at the moment. So this gives us a glimpse into the ironical nature of the crisis of the biopolitical that we are living through. Biopower, as Foucault formulated it, was all about securitizing human life. Health, food, housing are part of it. But a frenzied, you know, so biopower is really about what Montesquieu said, that the purpose of politics was to extend life a little more. But a frenzied expansion of biopower over the last few decades, the great acceleration of human history, has undone that security. The story of antibiotics encapsulates that irony. So it now takes many more times uh, uh, amount of penicillin, many more times compared to what it took during the war to cure an infection because of this antibiotic resistant bacteria. So the larger question that follows from this history of life that stares us in the face to the pandemic is this. Homo sapiens are a minority form of life, while they, the microbes, compose the majority forms of life. So I'm now coming back to the question of minority. That was important in, in Deleuze and Guattari's 68, multiplicity to minority. So we are a minor form of life. Homo sapiens have also been, and the viruses have also been the architects of life, on this planet. They, their presence inside our bodies makes us individually who we are. They and humans, and there is no human without a functioning microbiome, constitute together a whole living being that Lynn Margulis, using three Greek words, holos for whole, bios for bio, life, and ontos for being, referred to as holobiont. So me and my microbiome together is an entity that Lynn Margul is called the holobiont. To think of individual humans and their microbiome as constituting a whole living being is to think about the limits of the received tradition of modern political thought. For that thought has defined the human as a political subject by bracketing, putting in the container of the fatic the work of deep history, of geobiology of the planet, and of the viruses. So our crisis leaves us exposed to the fact that biologists and infectious disease specialists have known for a long time that we are a minority form of life that has behaved over the last hundred or so years as though the planet was created so that only humans would thrive. If all forms of life were human-like, so if everybody was human, and we sometimes do use our human imagination to think our way into animals and birds, but if all forms of life were humans, then the dominant humans would look like the whites in South Africa during the apartheid regime a racist minority dominating the majority with utterly selfish ruthlessness 
and imperiling everybody in the end. We would wonder if it were possible for humanity as a whole to look on themselves as a minor form of life and work towards a minoritarian forms of political thought of the kind that Arendt, as I mentioned, or Deleuze or Kafka have educated us in, thoughts that would want to avoid majoritarian, ironically in the case of a minority, dreams of domination. If viruses and bacteria were humans or human-like, our knowledge of them would look like colonial knowledge, the knowledge you have to defeat somebody, to dominate somebody. Even, um, so Ed Young, who has actually written a book, but this is a dilemma for human beings. So Ed Young's book on viruses, at the end, he ends up saying, so we have to work out how we might start to control these multitudes for our benefit. But the problem is he himself shows that we don't even know the world of viruses. There are viruses, uh, like we didn't know this particular virus that is affecting us. It used to live in the guts of bats. And bats are much older. Bats are 50 million years old. Homo sapiens are 300,000 years old. So this is a much more ancient virus. And, and we didn't even know about it. So the question of being able to control the bacterial viral world through human technology is a, a, is a kind of never-ending battle. So I then come back to this, to my last point, that if then the pandemic reminds us that we are a minority form of life, how do we actually behave as a minority form of life? What do we then, where do we go to learn? Now here, so this is where the question of looking at the non-West, and I like the way that this conference defined the non-West, because it did not define the non-West as outside of the geographical West. You actually said that the non-West includes the West, and, and I think all human societies before modernization, before modern technology, all human societies knew that seasons were important, that rains were important, sunshine was important, that, that our food production depended on what even the physiocrats used to think of as gifts of nature. Right? It is really only in modernity that we have tried to move away from gifts of nature and have sovereignty over nature. And one of the first roads that the British built in India, the, the distinctive feature of those roads were that they were called all-weather roads. Because until the British came with the technology of uh, macadamizing streets, roads were seasonal. Wars were seasonal. You could, not, you could not go across a river when the river was in torrential tide, when, or there was a very heavy monsoon, you had to wait. And all the, and you can, you can increasingly think that the development of insurance with regard to travel, cancellation of flights for bad weather. You know, these are all human attempts to actually manage the uncertainties of the natural world. Whereas before uh, this kind of technological modernity, people had to accept the uncertainties of the, of the natural world and live with those uncertainties and adjust. And therefore the question is if, now clearly there have been gains from this technology. The, the, if you look at the great acceleration graphs, human beings were 1.6 billion in, in 1900. So if you think of ourselves as 300,000 years old as a species, then it took us almost 300,000 years to get to the figure 1 billion. Then in 100 years, we were 6 billion. In another 20 years, we were 8 billion. <laughs> But at the same time, human longevity, life lifespan has also increased. Antibiotics have contributed to them. Uh, and that's why um, this correlation between development and what is called demographic transition has happened. That's why the settler colonial societies or more developed societies are aging societies and depend on immigration from the more populous part of the world. All these have happened. And Michael Warner has just written a very interesting book arguing that the availability of electricity at the flick of a switch, he describes as the unconscious of modernity. Now that's, it, it's only when that doesn't happen that we all get worried and call the government and what's happening. 
and and this so i'm not saying i'm not denying all of those things but if a particular animal that has been able to avail itself of all these advantages now wants to decide to live live like a like the minority form of life that it actually is without necessarily giving up on these advantages without and, and in fact attending to questions of justice between human beings the aspirations of indians and chinese or brazilians for modernization for a better quality of life if it has to do all of those things where do it where does it go to look for actual instances the reason why this is an unprecedented moment unlike may 68 is that we have no actual instances our knowledge of bacteria and viruses it comes from modern science no traditional society would have known about bacteria and viruses even the Buddha, when the buddhist said don't kill the small creatures they meant insects you could see science has given us the knowledge that they are the majority forms of life so that is why it's important it's a task of imagination and to develop our discussions about how to become a minority form of life without giving up on the advantages that humans value that is of human life and for that the moment is open just in the way that the question of multiplicity minority opened up um, created a moment when theorists like Deleuze and Guattari were interested in reading anthropology because anthropology provided them with actual sites and we now are in a particular situation which is not identical to May 68 but it has some similarities because the question of minority comes up again right and and that that opens up the question of indigenous knowledge non-western knowledge but only if we define the west in such a way non-western in such a way as to pluralize the west itself so long as we did not think dogmatically of a distinction between west and non-west um, i think we have to look everywhere to find instances and we will not find empirical instances of this kind before because this is a post-industrial moment of crisis unparalleled and unprecedented so i end there thank you very much everybody here and whoever is there online for coming and listening and i'm happy to answer questions thank you Uh, thank you for this great reminder, thinking with other forms of life. And I am, uh, my role is to open the discussion, so um, you are uh, invited to ask questions, and I will just come with uh, the microphone. Can you just uh, maybe introduce uh, shortly? Uh, you ask the question. Hello, everybody. I uh, represent the philosophy department here in, not represent, I'm part of, <laughs> as a doctoral candidate, and I uh, write a thesis on Karen Barad and the ontological, uh, uh, the relational ontology. And my question is ac actually very philosophical, but uh, um, perhaps it will be also interesting for for uh, other s other um, sciences here, um, because when I think of uh, in my thesis of non-anthropocentric perspective, I have to include the, the uh, anthropocentric perspective, just as yeah. you said with the West, right? So in the development of my thought, I found uh, the very same thing that you cannot actually create those dual. Um, I don't know con concept right. because they, uh, in the end, you have to <laughs> include the opposite within. Yeah. The, so this um, ontology of relations ca come up that the relation is as if first, and then out of the relation you have the possibility of distinguishing um, objects, for example, or 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 notions. Yeah. So. I find it very interesting that 
with your concept of minority, majority, it's again... Uh, Sorry, it's my phone reminding me. It, it's again uh, the same thing as if one should somehow include yeah. the other, right? And my suddenly, you know, I, I, I deal a little bit with the transitional state then. How, how is it possible if, if, if everything forms a, a relation as one, then also majority with the minority, somehow first they are one. Yeah. And then um, how, how, how would you conceptualize, or is it possible to conceptualize the transitional states? Do you become sort of minor, <laughs> or you become major, which which makes yeah. it even more, uh, which makes it even more complicated actually, yeah. because you can be the minor in a situation but yeah. a major in another direction, uh, another yeah. at the same time, yeah. or yeah. in the yeah. same yeah. space, yeah. right? So, I, I'm I'm very interested because those two concepts, minor mm -hmm. major, make it really interesting to see uh, uh, the the possibility of, and the, not only the possibility, but what comes out uh, as, a, an, as an asset from the transitions, that, that it's not like a deficit. Yeah. It, no, it's not a deficit. It, it, it's somehow a potential of yeah. those transitions mm. that we, when you become something, yeah. right? So I'm, I'm working on all that and this will be s super nice. And thank you for bringing all those concepts thank together you. to yeah. make it possible to thank ask you. such a question. Yeah. Thank, no, well, thank you for asking this question. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So first of all, uh, yes, and I, you know, I've often felt that um, when you read the historical, the more historical of sciences like geology, or evolutionary biology, which are historical in their own nature, um, it is really a human way of decentering humans, right? It, it's human thought that is actually able to decenter humans because you tell a story in such a way that humans come very late in the story to be at the center of it, um, and therefore it is. So I completely accept that relational thing. This is where it's so interestingly different from May 68. Because in May 68, they were only thinking politically and thinking of resisting the state. So it was actually easier to find societies where the state had not happened. The fact that the state had a history was already known. Engels had written about it. So within the left tradition, it was never thought that the state was perennial. And therefore, it was easier to historicize the state and anthropologize it and find societies where the state was not central. Today, I think it's very difficult to, so for instance then, when I say humans are a minority form of life, and I say in the same breath the ho that we are a holobiont, so the human is different from the holobiont. When I say human, like I'm Depeche, I have a certain biography, even certain species history that I can tell you. But I don't know my microbiome very well. I only become aware of it when it, it's not functioning well, mm. right? When I have an infectious disease or I have an illness, then the doctor, ulcer for instance, the doctor sees a particular bacteria doing it. And even there's uh, an argument that the H. pylori, the bacteria that causes ulcer, became a bad bacteria because of the overfeeding of antibiotics to uh, chicken, to farm animals, right? So, so, mo so in a way, the, the only way I can be a human being is actually by not knowing the whole holobiont. So being a human is already an abstraction from the communities of living that Lynn Margulis was talking about. And therefore, our political institutions are all based on the forgetting of the microbiome. When, when, uh, when I speak here, uh, I don't know what my microbiome is doing to help me to speak or not help me to speak. You know, uh, I was yesterday sharing with friends Bruno Latour's joke. Latour said, you, you think you have a craving for chocolate. It might be a microbiome <laughs> wanting chocolate, right? <laughs> so, so, the, so, so the question of becoming minor refers actually to the human ontology. 
so it's only in a limit it's only in the limited way that i am a human being and as a human being i am less than what i am and so what i am in deleuze's terms would be not one because i am a plurality my microbiome is a plurality right it's only by forgetting that i give myself one name i say i'm from india i'm brahmin by caste <laughs> all of those stories that i can tell right so so it's within that limited ontology of human beings on which our institutions are based our institutions are based on human phenomenology it's within that limited notion of being human that i ask the question of the politics of becoming minor in other words in other words so here's the difference from let's say what latour is saying or maybe donna haraway is saying and what i am saying i see latour and haraway and a lot of these people but particularly latour who is a very good friend and from whom i've learned a lot they are trying they try to imagine political institutions that combine the human and the non-human they like latour's parliament of things right without having any historical precedents for it so unlike 68 again it shows why it's un, why it's unparalleled and unprecedented 68 you actually go to anthropological evidence or historical evidence which exists we don't have any evidence of human beings and non-human beings coming together to form a parliament so let us imagine something called the parliament of things and i am saying that has a legitimacy because we have to imagine we now are dependent on the work of imagination right but my question is i know as knowledge cognitively that there is a microbiome i know scientifically that the microbes are the majority form of life i know scientifically that destroying forests brings all these unknown viruses and bacteria closer to me so i have to find a form of withdrawal edward wilson has a book called half earth where he says we should leave half of the surface of the planet for other other creatures now it's unpractical but he has a practical proposal he says there are about 147 national parks in the world we should restore all these national parks to their the ecology they had before human intervention and some national parks in america are trying to do that i i know that so these are all ways of becoming minor so these are all ways of coming back as opposed to people who say we should engineer the climate we should build even more technology to get out of the problem right so there are people who argue that we should do more of what we are doing in order to correct the errors of what we are doing but the politics of becoming minor is actually a politics of not doing that it's a politics of withdrawing but how do we withdraw this uh, the difficulty today is that i can't like like deleuze and guattari i can't go back and read old anthropology to find out as they did evidence against the state i'm actually looking for a politics for which there is no precedence and that's why i think it opens us up to both existing evidence and imagination the work of art the work of literature the work of imagination it becomes very important to actually then answer the question how do we actually become live like a minor form of life without giving up on what humans value or what humans have come to value because within humanity the question of justice is about access to energy indians and chinese they want more energy they want more electricity they want more education and you can't just say no to that if you hang on to it so you know uh, eduardo uh, actually janowski and de castro have a, they have a moment in the book where they say that indigenous knowledge will become valuable only after a catastrophe <laughs> so they say it is in a world and i'm quoting verbatim from memory it is in a world of diminished human capabilities that indigenous knowledge will be valuable but the problem is as a historian i think there's no guarantee that a catastrophe will actually leave you free to follow the indigenous life the catastrophe might be even more catastrophic than that right so actually you can't depend on a catastrophe to solve the problem so that's why it's a very interesting moment it's not like 68 but the question of the minority runs through this moment too because because it's still because climate change is a question of domination humans and certain formation around humans have come to dominate the order of life 
in a way we've never dominated the last 70 80 100 years that this has really happened and therefore i think with edward wilson i think of that our knowledge is telling us to withdraw uh, and it is up to us to imagine many forms of withdrawal i mean the pandemic the pandemic forced us to travel less and we know that many animals came back to cities the rivers became cleaner the skies were bluer even delhi became less less polluted you know calcutta became less polluted and the pandemic forced that so the pandemic taught us that when humans are forced to withdraw other creatures live better and somehow it's a matter of our being willing to do it voluntarily in ways that are also beneficial for us you know that's what i'm talking about Thank you. We have other questions. Uh, there is also some kind of comment, uh, I guess, in the in the chat that it's very interesting about the history of uh, fermentation, uh, and uh, there are some, let's say, um, I don't know if uh, indigenous, but definitely alternative ways of knowing uh, microbes. And this is also there is some progress, as you were saying, and so in the chat. There is always there is also a discussion on it. Um, so I will take a question from the from the room. Just have to, have to move a little. Hello, my name is Iyad Hassami. I'm a postgraduate researcher uh, in the School of English at the University of Leeds, um, working on agriculture ecology uh, in modern Lebanon. Uh, it's really a delight to be here. Thank you for the conference organizers. Thank you so much for the wonderful keynote. Um, I was struck by how you integrate political theory and zo zoonotic control. Um, and uh, the work of James C. Scott also comes to mind. I was uh, waiting for uh, you to address uh, his latest book, Against the Grain, yeah. uh, which addresses, uh, touches on questions of zoonotic control and agroecological control as well. Um, and my question for you really is about how you understand the Darwinian evolution of life. I found that uh, Darwinian thought sort of undergirded your talk. Um, and um, I've come across debates about uh, what actually Darwinian evolution of life means, what his evolutionary theory is. Is it an evolutionary theory of interspecies dependency? Um, or is it an evolutionary theory of competition? So. Could you please elaborate? Is is Darwin advocating for mi microbiomes within um, within the unit of the species or not? For instance, thanks. But, see, my understanding is that certain aspects of Darwinian um, theory of evolution can be debated with respect to viruses, for instance. Uh, do they constitute a species, for instance? Can the concept of species be applied? But what people accept is that they evolve and, and there's natural selection within viruses, depending on whether it's the RNA virus and DNA virus. One of the interesting things about the coronavirus is that it's an RNA virus, and, a, and the RNA virus doesn't have certain polymerase chemicals that normally act as proofreaders when the virus gets reproduced. So normally a virus's internal mechanism would make sure that what is reproduced is like that virus. But in a purely RNA virus, it doesn't have that much control on how it's being reproduced. So it's reproduced with errors or, dev or deviation. That's why it produces many more multiple variants more quickly, right, than a DNA-based virus. And the coronavirus is an RNA virus, vi based virus. But that, this is evolution, is both in the language that the virus is evolving you know, in the press but this is also accepted in the literature, as I understand it. But there are debates, for instance, about uh, the degree to which the concept of species can be actually applied to many forms of life. There, there are debates about that. Um, and as I understand Darwin's concept of evolution, it is both about competition and collaboration. But really, the critical thing is natural selection. The fact that it introduces diversity within the same species by being historically sensitive to a situation in which a group of spe uh, members of species find, th find themselves. And from what I've read about speciation, so I have a uh, colleague uh, um, who has a book called Why Evolution is True, he's an evolutionary biologist. 
And what they emphasize is this whole, whole concept of natural selection, that the natural selection works. And which is other, other, otherwise you don't understand speciation, why from one species a new species can emerge and evolve. Um, but in many ways, that, like the, the third chapter, the, the third chapter is very interesting in the origin of species, where Darwin is trying to argue why every species has more progenies uh, than it would need, or it would make sense to have. So his, his answer is statistical, even though Darwin is not very good at statistics. He says, look, it's because they, every species knows or knows that most of the offsprings will die. So it's kind of a statistical hedging against death. And humans are the only species that were actually able to reduce the number of offsprings, given the benefits of modern technology and medicine. So my grandfather had 15 kids. My father had two. I have one. <laughs> so <laughs> so it's, it's some kind of testimony to what modern medicine was able to achieve in terms of human mortality. And therefore, we thought we are outside of the Darwinian history. Right? All other species have to produce more offspring. We don't. Right? And that you see, the human exceptionalism, I was discussing with friends last night, I mean, in the management of fisheries, for instance, humans decided that every species has a harvestable surplus. If tigers were in charge, we wouldn't like it if the tigers said, okay, humanity has a harvestable surplus. It wouldn't hurt humanity if I took so many humans off. Right? It would still be able to survive species-wise. So, th so the idea of human exceptionalism has, of course, marked many modes of thought. But particularly, I mean, even if you look at uh, the way we thought about population, population demography, lifespan, we thought that while natural selection might, appeal, uh, might still apply to us, but we were out of the third chapter of a Darwinian history of life. All I'm saying is that we're actually dealing with, a Darwin, uh, with an episode in Darwinian history of life. The one part of the pandemic is that, even though we discuss, when we discuss the pandemic politically, we don't discuss it in terms of becoming minor. We discuss it in terms of sovereignty, global governance, access to vaccination. Right? So we make it a human-only story. And the microbe is just a silent thing that we have to control. That's what I was saying. Yeah. Thank you. Could I have some more water, please? Yes. Yes. There is another question. Introduce yourself. Yes. Uh, Beatrice Rivera Barnes. I'm a professor at Penn State University. Um, the f regarding the first part of your lecture, the political, uh, I often wonder well, with Deleuze and Guattari, first of all, uh, choosing Kafka and say saying he was minor, he was really not minor uh, at that moment. He, he could have been minor. And the result of uh, the um, multiplicity versus uniformity and, and the resulting issues, I wonder, because everybody became a, a champion of multiculturalism, uh, so were we championing multiplicity or were we really managing a crisis in the sense that maybe the minority was no longer a minority? Mm -hmm. okay. So. Uh, so, and then the second part may be, uh, do humans have standing? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and in whose court? <laughs> yeah, the second question is very interesting, and I just wish polar bears could speak. <laughs> no, and uh, yes, so multiculturalism, I, as you will definitely know, I mean, there are all kinds of critiques of official multiculturalism, precisely in those, those that, in other words, the multi there did not challenge the idea of the mono uh, in the way that you saw multi as different instances of the mono and, uh, and multiculturalism could become an instrument of assimilation into the projects of the state, the nation state. And I mean like ethnic radios being supported by nation states and things like that. So there are many examples of that. And there was a, there was pr in those terms, I mean that, I imagine the multiplicity that Foucault was talking about 
was precisely one that would subvert and resist any statist principles. So it's more anarchist thi thinking about the multi. Uh, so the idea is that, um, so sometimes you know you could explain it by saying that it's a way of thinking about the plural in such a way um, that the very question of what it is a plurality of becomes unanswerable or becomes meaningless. So a kind of, so some people used to use the word fragment in the 80s in the same way to say that a fragment is not a shard which is a piece of the whole. So in archaeological finds you sometimes find pieces that you would put together to say a Roman vessel look like this, right? But whereas the more radical idea of the fragment was the, the fragment is that which helps us to question the idea of the whole itself. And that's why the whole category of not one, which Irigari used in that book, this, this sex which is not one, right? So there's the idea of a not oneness, which fundamentally questions the idea of something being one. And the state was seen as the ultimate principle of embodiment of that one. So it was trying to get away from the one and the many problem in such a way that you define the many to make it uncomfortable for the one, <laughs> right? To question the existence of the one. Yeah. Um, maybe I can also um, add a question from the chat that was uh, asked. Um, uh, by one person. Um, Did you mind? Do you have the name of the person? Um, it's only Olena. Okay. Um, so, so the question is: um, There is now a challenge to capture the environmental damage from war of Russia against Ukraine, in particular considering huge fire damage to soil, microbial communities. Yeah. So, can you follow up? On yeah, this? I mean, I I think of secular wars as the most anthropocentric wars uh, you know even when you fight religious wars you you assume gods and gods or different gods on your side or it's not humans only but these secular wars are so anthropocentric that you don't think of what you're doing to the soil what you're doing to the birds to animals I mean forget human beings you're, you're killing them and with this particular war uh, it's already I mean there are two impacts I see globally one is of course in the wheat market you know Ukraine was a large exporter of wheat, and there's a scarcity of wheat. India stopped uh, exporting Indian wheat to, to the global market because of the, uh, because of the scarcity of wheat. So it has already had an impact on food prices. And then there's the fossil fuel problem. On the one hand, uh, gas prices have gone up, petrol prices have gone up everywhere, but also the fact that Russia is making special deals to give gas at a cheaper rate to India and China and some other, other countries, that also is not good for the climate debate. It, it continues the fossil fuel regime for longer. So I don't see anything good about this war. Sure. Yeah. This is a good but, um, um, if I may, I have a question. Um, because um, maybe in other, in other terminology to, uh, uh, to translate a little bit, <coughs> uh, what you've said. I think we will still ask about survival um, of human species. And uh, we are, you know, we learned a lot about our vulnerability, but we want also to learn more about our resilience. So could you please uh, help me a little bit to understand how to um, discursivize or narrate yeah. human survival um, issue. So here, you know, uh, it's interesting. As a historian, I find that what privileged people like myself included think of as the future, like a disaster looming in the future, is sometimes a disaster that has already happened in the lives of the poor. So what I think of future is sometimes present. Uh, example to give is, uh, so in my own state of West Bengal, where I come from in India, 
there are um, you know where the ganges flows into the sea in the estuary there are fishing communities and and women who stand all day waist deep in water with cane baskets and they catch small fish but what has happened is that the sea level has risen and uh, the water has become salty so not only the fish has changed that they're catching but because they stand all day in waist deep water the salt in the water is producing fungal infections inside their reproductive organs and what happened was a rogue team of doctors moved in and they were doing hysterectomy on these women making a lot of money out of them so my feminist friends were trying to lobby the government to bring in a law to regulate hysterectomy you know and i would have never connected hysterectomy with climate change i would have never thought that but when i when i read this i realized that for these poor women sea level rise is not something <laughs> that they read about it is producing effects deep inside their bodies right and some people are making money so people are trying to create a politics that would actually stop them from making making this money so first of all uh, said one level survival this is this is an instance of survival at one level i mean the feminist friends are fighting so that these poor women can survive right even in these changed circumstances so humans will always always fight and secondly philosophically this is a very interesting question so for a long time surely since kant but also in hannah arendt the human condition some philosophers have thought that humans are not meant merely to survive to survive is what animals do right so we don't think of survival as politics that's why hannah arendt says that politics is a higher thing it's not about survival and kant says the same thing that that actually our maturity comes when we are free of the survival and we create life think of elon musk and his dreams of living on mars so we live in times when the rich and the privileged think of surviving <laughs> right i mean normally i think survival is the politics of the poor but the crisis is such that even the rich are trying to survive by moving to better lands you know moving to land that will not be affected by climate change in every country there's a discussion internally of the map of which part of the country will be affected more by climate change and which part will not be and <laughs> i don't have to be a social studies student to tell you that the rich will all go to the parts that they think will survive so in a sense whatever kant or hannah arendt is to think of the political as distinct from survival i would say that that distinction is collapsing because the very rich are actually interested in surviving thank you thank you any more questions any reflections comments much to think about now in the time so you done but then um, yeah. uh, if I, if i may uh, i can um definitely i can see some uh, some questions also here so i think at at the beginning there was a question that um why on trees and rivers so it was like a paraphrase of your of your title um how about other forms of nature uh, but i think the whole lecture was was about it but um but maybe we can we can come back to this um food cultures question uh, which was asked by professor anna naher and uh, she says that uh, there is a path running along with modern science and based on collaboration with microorganisms rather than battling them and what does current renaissance of fermentation in culinary practices and art mean for our cultural or i would even add historical moment i think that's a great question uh, i i would love to learn from her or on that question i think she has thought more than i have yeah. on that question so i think it's a great question though yeah. Yeah. so it's good that no. i quoted it there is a question from the room wonderful <laughs> uh, 
Hi, I'm Simona from the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, and I have a short question. Uh, do you think that the indigenous knowledge could help people to cope with natural disasters and climate changes, especially the poor people? Thank you very much. I think local knowledge will anywhere help, including indigenous knowledge. See, the, the problem with climate change is that if you believe the science, <coughs> or if you take the science seriously. So IPCC, the science actually works by considering the planet as one. And we think of ourselves as many. So the politics is actually about converting the planet into many. Right. So IPCC says, so IPCC gives out a calendar which is really about the planet as one. So IPCC will say, by 2030, you should have, or 2040, you should have emitted as much carbon dioxide as you want to. All the nations taken together. I don't care how you divide it up. Then a place like India will come to the US and say, now we are developing, we need more coal. You guys, for the next 20 years, you use renewable and let us use coal. That's dividing up the planet. Now whether dividing up the planet will actually address the need for synchronized action that IPCC calls for. So do you see what I'm saying? If you think of the planet as one, then the IPCC is saying, whatever are your differences, act together by a certain time. The politics of making the planet many is the politics that is at work when nations bargain for more time. Now whether that will actually, if the science is right, then that may or may not miss the IPCC's calendar of action. So it means that the climate crisis might become worse. While it's true that at the local level, there's a lot to be done locally, a lot to be done personally, and there, uh, as I said, you know, both indigenous cultures and peasant cultures were much more aware of the relationship between seasons, food, growing, even about going hungry. Uh, sort of getting less less to eat in certain seasons. And that kind of wisdom is always useful. I mean, it's always, it's, it's good. But, but then it fights against the aspirations of the global middle class, which is increasing, and which wants more of the amenities. Every time you have a new middle class, people come into money, they want to, one thing they want to eat more of is protein. So one result of that today is that the most populous bird on the planet. The most populous bird is broiler chicken. We have 21 billion broil broiler chickens. And the next naturally most populous bird is 1.5 billion. <laughs> so we have produced so many chickens. For our, if you look at animals we eat, it's the same story. And the more you have people in India and China who are coming into affluence, they will want to eat more protein. So, so there's a tension in the world between people who want to modernize, become middle class, have these amenities, and the wisdoms we need to acquire. <laughs> and how you bring the two together is a very difficult question. And that's why th the politics of the planetary politics becomes, in effect, one of dividing the planet up, while the science treats the planet as one. Thank you. There's a question. Hello, thank you for a great speech. Um, Deepak, I would like to ask because um, I like very much uh, this idea that antifascist means to embrace multiplicity uh, and uh, there is a great potential in multiplicity, but we are also talking about multiplicity and being um, minor in the situation of crisis. And in a fear we are living today, when we do realize that we are minor and there is something bigger than us, something we cannot control. So there are like two fields in which I can, from one point of view, see the potential, the power of multiplicity, but also this weakness, vulnerability, even sometimes vulnerability, of course, is a power, not a weakness. 
But I would like to ask you how maybe also personally you are dealing with the fear and is it possible to use your inner multiplicity in this crisis situation as a potential? Somehow, somewhere, I'm addressing to your question to even for a little while to leave the idea of surviving, especially in a privileged position in which you are aware of what is going on around, and to go beyond survival, feel kind of calmness, or use it as a potential, the multiplicity also inside you, also you as a weak person in front of viruses, which is really scary sometimes. So what kind of method you are using? Is it about m imagination, to use imagination, art, or maybe post-secular perspective? Because I am still looking for a hope. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No, uh, no, 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 it, but, but see, partly I think it goes back to the question of human ontology. I think, you know, people make a distinction between hope and optimism. Optimism, I think, is a matter of temperament. Some people are optimistic, some people are pessimistic. That's you. But hope, I think, is human. I mean, hope is the relationship we have to the future, unless you're insane. You know? So in, in that sense, I think humans can never lose hope, because hope is, I mean, hope is the, in speaking this sentence, my hope is that I'll finish it. Right? It's really what uh, Heidegger describes the everyday as, as this. One could s bringing Ernst Bloch and Heidegger together, you might be able to say that hope is the principle by which I forget the possibility of dying the next moment. Right? And, that, and that's built into us. But what you're maybe looking for is a reason, ground for optimism, which is different from hope. With hope, you struggle. The work you do with traumatized people, you do that with hope, right? Because you, you don't have to be optimistic. I mean, you might be even intellectually accept that we live in a very difficult situation. It may be difficult for the traumatized people to get over their trauma, but you still try because you have hope. Hope is existential. Um, but optimism, um, on optimism there are many different <laughs> positions. The Chinese writer Lu Sun, used to write very depressing stories. And people asked him, why do you write such depressing stories? And he said, because I, I hope <laughs> that one day somebody will feel desperate enough to do something about it. <laughs> so he was using despair as motivation. Right? Uh, look, something you said to me last night over dinner stayed with me, and I was writing to a friend in Calcutta about it, which is that historical situations have an impact on our existential capacities. So if you have refugees in small numbers, it's much easier for the host population to be nice about them. But if they get overwhelmed by the number of refugees, I however you dis think about it, it's more difficult for humans to accept a sudden influx of people, right? It could be people could be internal refugees. Within India, people move from one place to another and people get upset. So, and now we're in a state, I mean, the world is producing refugees, but the number of, you know, the official number of refugees in the world, even accepted, is like 67 million. People say unofficial, it's about 100 million. And if the sea level goes up and the temperature rises, it rises by three degrees, it could be three, 400 million. So, imagine a world that is going to face that. On the one hand, you know, my political science colleagues say that because everybody most of the major powers have nuclear powers. So they said there won't be a third world war, but there'll be a lot of little conflicts going on. Now that's not a very nice world <laughs> to, to live in, but, uh, but to me that sounds realistic, looking around, right, more than other things. So, um, so I can't, uh, so I can tell you that hope is eternal. Optimism <laughs> varies. <laughs> Thank you. I think we can, this is a perfect moment to, uh, to finish <laughs> up with <laughs> hope <laughs> rather right. than being yeah. scared and yeah. feared. Thank you very much Thank for you. this lecture. Yeah. It was yeah. really a pleasure to moderate it. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for doing it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.